Hey everyone, good morning on this Easter morning. So good that you're tuning in and um, we're going to watch a video and then we're going to worship together and then I'll be right back. In Matthew chapter 6, it says, Who by worrying can add to their life? Pandemic. Do not worry about tomorrow. Pagans run after these things. National emergency. Philippians 4 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. My sheets are melting so fast. They just miss a long An interesting fact about humanity is that whatever you feed grows. A financial pandemic. If you feed your faith, it grows. If you feed your fears, they grow. It's all spiral very quickly. It's going to get worse. Some have to live and some have to die. Realize that our time is better spent talking to the Father than getting all worked up and reading and feeding our minds with the news and the media about what everybody is saying about how this is doom and gloom and how money, which we have hoped in, is lost. Hope not in money. Hope in your Father, your God, Jesus Christ, your Savior. Have your faith and use it. Walk according to it. Whatever you feed grows. This is the time to press into the church, lean into the church, to be surrounded by God's people. We can offer prayers for one another. We can offer hope to one another. We can speak words of truth to one another. If you feast on the word of God and you renew your minds around the truth, your faith, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But if you go to the news and you read article after article after quote after talking head and you continue to feed those fears, they grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger. Whatever you feed grows. Today, did you wake up this morning and feast on the word of God and go to him in prayer? Or did you feed your fears? Stop the Lord Almighty. 
again to you. So great that you're tuning into our online service and we hope that this service today will be a blessing and an encouragement to you in this season. Why don't you take a picture right now and show everybody how you are viewing this service. Maybe you just had your Easter breakfast or you're about to have your Easter lunch together and why don't you post a picture, put it on your social media and use the hashtag CC the table and tag us as well. We would love to see your pictures. We also want to take a moment this morning to congratulate our Heise location. Today they are five years old. How great is that? Hey Heise and Campus, congratulations on five years. Uh, it's been such a privilege to be part of the first three years of this journey. And I still have to think about you guys uh, often and especially think about that one day, that first Easter Sunday that we gathered. And after all uh, was finished and we packed up and we sat back to the garage and we stood there and I believe it was me and Timon and uh, Henny and Jeroen. And we looked at each other when we were closing off, uh, realizing this is gonna be every Sunday from now on. Every Sunday we're gonna need to pack out and pack in and this is gonna be a weekly thing. And there were still a lot of moments uh, in our journey where we had to um, really uh, face the facts and, and push through and, and go on. But uh, as I see now, it's five years and God is doing amazing things uh, amongst you guys. And I just look forward to everything that God is still going to do in the next five years. Amen. And this morning, we're going to listen to an Easter message brought by Pastor Sebastian. He's going to talk about Lazarus. But before we do that, we do want to transition into a time of giving. You know, even though we're not going to be coming together physically in our buildings, we do want to set a time apart to give back of what we have. You know, every Sunday we set a time apart to give, and it's not because we want you to see it as an I have to, but we want you to have the opportunity to start seeing it as an I want to. I want to partner with God and sow back into his kingdom. And in a minute, we're going to pray for the offering, and I want to encourage you to really ask the Lord what it is that you can give back. And we have a few ways that you can give. We have a QR code that is in the screen right now. We, you can scan it with your phone and it will navigate you to the um, website where you can do your online giving. If you are not able to do that, you can click the link in the description and it will lead you to the same place. So let's take a moment right now to pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything that you give us. We thank you for a new day and the fact that we can celebrate Easter, God. God, we thank you for all that you've given us, and we ask you right now what it is that we can sow back into your kingdom. What do we have that we can give back to you? Please open our hearts, open our eyes, and open our ears for what the message is going to bring to us this morning. What do you want to speak to us, God? We are ready for a new, a new word from you, God, a new encounter from you. We Thank you for all that you are and all that you give us and that you love us so much, Lord. We love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, this is Sebastian van Wessem, lead pastor of Celebration Church Netherlands. And I'm so glad that you tuned in to this, uh, this broadcast of our online services today. And uh, thankful that, you, that you're there and want to know more about um, Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday. And because this is Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate that Jesus rose from the dead. And this is a powerful, powerful story that you can find in the New Testament, but it was already prophesied in the Old Testament. And, um, you know, I don't know about you, but these last couple of weeks have, have really left me wondering, you know, 
when is God going to bring a change to the situation that we're currently facing with the corona crisis and everything else that's going on around that? Um, and, and sometimes it feels like, you know, everything is lost. It feels like, you know, the economy, the way we've experienced it and our health and all these other great things that we, 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 basically, had, we basically trusted in, they've been taken away. But you know what? When everything seems to, be, to, have, to have been lost, God turns it around for good. There's always light at the end of the tunnel when Jesus is our Lord, when, when God is in our life. And, um, and actually, that's what we want to talk about today. God wants to deliver on his promise uh, for us. And, and today's story we're going to look at from the Bible is actually the story about a man named Lazarus. Uh, you know, of course, I could, I could share a whole lot about Jesus' own resurrection, but he explains a lot about his own future resurrection um, by raising somebody else from the dead, but a man by the name of Lazarus. And it wasn't the first time he did that um, as he was walking around this earth. But this is just a, a remarkable, remarkable story uh, that we want to zoom in on today. And uh, so I want to invite you to um, pick up your own Bible, uh, preferably a paper Bible, go to John chapter 11, John chapter 11, and, and just take one of those old-fashioned markers and, and mark scriptures that God is highlighting to you um, and, and just really dig into the word today as we, as we, as we read the word. And maybe you even want to read along and I'm, when I'm um, reading some of the scriptures and they also appear on the screen because it's just good to really let the word of God sink into our hearts uh, today. So let's pray. Father, we come to you at this moment. We want to thank you for your presence in our homes, uh, wherever else we're meeting together with family, maybe with friends. And God, we pray, Lord, that today you will speak to us. You will do something remarkable in our lives today. You'll inspire us and equip us, God. And we thank you, God, for the fact that Jesus rose from the dead on that third day. And that, God, you want to raise us up from the dead as well. Uh, Father, uh, a, a spiritual death, but also a physical death. Uh, a, a one day when we, when, when we die, Lord, we know that one day you'll raise us up from the, from the dead as well. We thank you, God, for your promises and that you'll fulfill those promises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in John chapter 11, we see a story uh, about a man named Lazarus. And Lazarus was a really good friend of Jesus. And he had two sisters, Mary and Martha. They were also really good friends with Jesus. And, and Mary sends word to Jesus that, his, that her brother, Lazarus, is really sick. And instead of just, you know, going, with a, going to, uh, to, the, to the town of Bethany where, where Lazarus lived right away, Jesus kind of tarries around where he was at that moment and actually waits a couple of days after, after Lazarus' death. Four days in total. And, uh, but he wasn't playing with his disciples. In fact, he told them that, that Lazarus was sleeping. Verse uh, 12 says this, well, if he's sick, he will, he will get better soon. If he's sleeping and just sick, he'll get better soon. You know, usually that's a good cure for, for many of the sicknesses that we have, except for, you know, some of the more serious sicknesses and even like corona you know for for some of us who had it it wasn't a big deal but for others it has been a big deal and and sleeping won't won't cut it to really get us healed up but here the disciples are thinking well if he's if he's sleeping and if he's if he's truly sick he'll he'll get better don't worry about it but then Jesus tells him plainly that he had died and that's why we pick up the story in verse 14 then Jesus told him plainly, Lazarus has died and for your sake I'm glad that I wasn't there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. I just love that story there. It just feels like he's either very brave, Thomas, because he was afraid that, you know, of persecution and they were you know, like starting to rise up against Jesus. And, and, and Thomas is thinking, well, maybe I should go with Jesus. Maybe we should go with him and, uh, you know, with the other disciples. You know, let's, let's just be really strong-willed men here as well. And, and if he dies, we'll die with him. Or was he just being cynical at this moment? I, I actually think the last thing, you know, that I was just being cynical here. Verse 17, and when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in a tomb for four days. It must have been pretty bad at this moment. 
the situation with Lazarus. It's like there's no hope anymore that Lazarus will live again. And Martha said later in the story when, when Jesus asked for the stone to be removed from that rock grave and she says in perfect King James English, he stinketh, he stinketh. So it was that bad that Lazarus was stinking. Four days. You know, there's a, there's a Jewish tradition that says this. For three days after death, the soul hovers over the body, intending to re-enter it. But as soon as it sees its appearance change, it departs. So here is Lazarus, his body in the grave for four days. He must have been smelly by now, and there's no hope anymore that the soul would re-enter his body. In other words, the Jewish people must have thought by then that he was dead, as dead as a doornail. But then Jesus appears on the scene when nobody would doubt anymore that Lazarus truly was dead. Verse 18 says this, Bethany, the town where Lazarus lived, was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. You see how Mary and Martha were mourning the death of their brother. You know, sometimes it's so easy to kind of rationalize things. And it's like, you know, well, he will, he will live one day, so we don't have to be sad about it. You know, even Jesus wept in the story here. Later on, we won't be reading it today. And, and, and what, you, what you have to notice in this, in this story, that it's okay to cry. It's all right to, be, to mourn. It's okay to be emotional when bad stuff happens. It's okay when, when your, health, your own health has been robbed from you in this season. It's okay to mourn when, when, you, when you hear about your family members or friends dying from corona or from something else. It's okay to mourn. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to cry. It really is. I really think that when we take this message to heart that, you know, that we wouldn't have all the mental health issues that we're currently facing in Western society if we were just given the freedom, given the okay to mourn to cry, to weep when bad stuff happens in our lives. But watch this. Not only was there uh, like a realism and sadness in, in, in Martha's response, there was also faith in her response. Faith was bubbling up in her heart. She knew that Jesus had the power to heal the sick, but who knows, maybe he also had the power to raise the dead. And that's what she was hoping for. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Now Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again on the, in the resurrection on the last day. It almost feels like when I read this, that Martha now suddenly became like a theologian. You know, but Jesus wasn't hinting at an eschat eschatological reality, something that would happen in the future. No, you know, yeah, one day Lazarus would rise again. Sure, that's, that's, that's the truth. Could it be that Martha was trying to find comfort in knowing that, that would happen one day probably but Jesus was talking about a present reality he wasn't talking about something eschatological something that would happen in the future she was talking about the fact that Lazarus was Lazarus Lazarus would rise now Lazarus can rise now verse 25 Jesus said to her I am the resurrection and the life whoever believes in me though he die he shall live and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die do you believe this Martha, you know what? We can only find eternal, incorruptible life in Jesus alone because he is the resurrection and the life. If you live in him and if you believe in him, you will never die, even though you physically may die, just like Lazarus died physically. You will rise. You will live. In fact, we can experience eternal life right now, right here in our life. Whatever happens to our mortal bodies at the moment. But watch this. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. You may not see this because you don't have the cultural 
background, the context that the Jews had that were listening to Jesus here. But when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, he was actually making a reference to something that happened in the Old Testament where God revealed himself as the I am. Exodus 3, 13, you know, it's just like God and Moses having this conversation with one another. And Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is your name? What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, here it comes, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Jesus here self-identifies as Yahweh in the flesh. Yahweh was the, was, the, was the covenant name of God. Whenever, you know, you see in the Old Testament, when you see the, the word Lord with small capitals, actually in the Hebrew it says Y-H-W-H, which is Yahweh, the covenant name of the Lord. And here Jesus self-identifies as Yahweh. Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh. I could do a whole study about this, which will take you probably several hours, and it's worthwhile to, to dig into that truth that Jesus was already there in the Old Testament. Jesus is Yahweh. We could look into that, but we don't have time. But it's important to understand this, that when Jesus said that I am the resurrection of the life, he is Yahweh himself. I love this. Acts 2.24, 2, Peter, one of the disciples, always number one, you know, whenever you see a list of disciples in the, in the New Testament, you, you always see his name printed first. And, and here, you know, he's preaching. You know, after he had denied Jesus three times, when Jesus had restored him, now he gets to deliver this, 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 this sermon after Jesus had risen from the dead to, to a th over a thousand, thousands and thousands of people in the city of Jerusalem on Pentecost Sunday. And he says this, but God... I love it when a, when a verse starts with those words, but God. It's like God turns something around. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. Death cannot hold him in his power. There was no way that Jesus would remain dead in the grave. The power of life is so much stronger than the power of death. There was no way that that stone would remain in front of Jesus' own grave. Jesus is the author of life, Acts 3.15 3, says. And the New American Standard Bible translated as Jesus is the prince of life. Jesus is a resurrection of life. He's the prince of life. He is life itself. He's the author of life. Jesus had to rise from death. And if we live in him and believe in him, that same power of life will raise us from the dead. And that is good news for, for all of us today. No matter what situation you're facing, no matter what report the doctor gave to you, no matter if you're on intensive care or if everything is going fine with your health at the moment, we know that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. We know that there is a resurrection waiting for you. We know that there is life when we trust in Jesus, when Jesus is our number one. We have eternal life right now if we have placed our faith and our loyalty in Jesus on this side of eternity. Our body may die, our body will die, but there is life. Right now, right here, abundant life and eternal life when our body passes away. So what should be our response when Jesus says, everyone who believes in me shall never die? I believe Martha's response is the best response. Verse 27, she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Let me just kind of divide that up, that, that verse. Let me kind of look into the details of what Martha was actually saying here. She first says yes. I don't know about you, but sometimes that word yes is so hard for me to say before the Lord. It's like I always have my own reservations. I always have my own, uh, like, theories and stuff why I shouldn't trust God, why I shouldn't place my faith in him. But Martha said, yes. She said, yes, Lord. 
And sometimes that's the only thing that we have to say when we're mourning, when we're mourning the loss of a loved one, when we're going through a tough situation economically, the only thing that you and I have to say is yes. Yes, Lord. Allow Jesus to have his way in your life, no matter what it would look like. Second thing that he said, what she said to Jesus was, Lord, Lord. Well, this is something I could talk about for a long time as well, but the Greek word for Lord is kurios. And that same word is being used in the Old Testament, the Ultimate Testament translation in Greek, which is called the, the Septuagint. Every time when the Old Testament has these four letters, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, the Septuagint translates it as kurios. You know why? Because the, the, the Jews would, would pronounce it Yahweh as Adonai. Every time they, they'd use that word Adonai, and Adonai is translated as, as kurios, as, as Lord in the Greek. So Jesus, so, so um, Martha here is acknowledging that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is kurios, that Jesus is Yahweh. She confirms that here. Powerful. She also says that he is the Christ. Now, sometimes we think that Christ is like Jesus' last name, Jesus Christ, superstar. No, it's not his last name, Christ. Christ is a title. It is actually the Christ. It's a title, and it means, like the Greek word for, for Christ is Christos, and it means anointed one, the, the anointed one. Jesus is the Christos. He is the anointed one. He is like what the, what the Hebrews would call the Messiah, Mashiach. He, Jesus is the anointed Davidic king. He is king. He is Lord. He is, he is God. She also calls him the son of God. In other words, this is God himself. That's how the, how the, in the Hebrew thinking, um, whenever you would say the son of God, it basically, it basically meant that he is God himself. She also said that he was coming into the world. Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh. He is God himself walking in a human body around on this world. But I want to zoom in on something else here. She said, I believe. I believe. Or actually, it's, she said, I have believed. So it's something that, that was like fulfilled and it's still going on at this moment as well. The Greek word, the Greek verb that's being used there is the word pisteo. Pisteo, which means placing allegiance in someone Declaring allegiance to someone. I believe pistao and faith, which is the word pistis. Those are Greek words, but they're being used here in a Hebrew context. And they mean something different than what we say, what we mean when we say I believe. The Western mindset is like, if I can't understand it, if, if it fits between my two ears, I believe it. If I can see the logic of it, I believe it. First seeing, then believing. That's one of the statements we would, we would make in our culture. But the Hebrew context is something else. If I believe, my actions will be different. If I believe, my words will be different. I believe in faith means something totally different in the Hebrew context. And faith should actually be translated as something like allegiance. It is a vow to a faithful covenant relationship God is faithful he is loyal to us and in response he wants us to be faithful he wants us to be loyal to him it's a two-way covenantal relationship between God and us when we truly believe in the Hebrew way within the personal relationship we have with the Lord we will trust him to the point that we have full confidence in him and we will take action based off of that confidence based off of that relationship i love ephesians 2 verse 8 through 10 it says this for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of your this is not of your own doing this is not because of your good works or something like that it is the gift of god not as a result of works, so that one may boast so that no one may boast for we are his workmanship created in christ jesus for good works which god prepared beforehand that we should walk in them you know, the Protestant Reformation told us, told us well, you know, we're not saved by works. Our works don't save us. 
But when it taught us that salvation was by faith alone, it missed out on an important fact, and that is that we were created for good works. We're created to be God's imagers, to represent him in the world by demonstrating his love in practical ways to the people around us. We need to demonstrate our loyalty to the King of kings and Lord of lords. So faith is better translated as allegiance. And when we translate it this way, it doesn't erase our trust and our faith in, in Jesus, our, our believing in him, but it does take our faith to a way deeper level than what it used to be. One that is faithful to the Bible's own teaching and the Bible's own context. Faith in King Jesus means loyalty and allegiance to King Jesus. Back to John 11, verse 25, 26. I am, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who, who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Now, what is your response to that question? I believe that that is a, a question all of us have to answer in this lifetime. And the purpose of the Gospel of John, you can find it in, in, the, in, in chapter 20. Verse 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is written at the end of the story, but Martha actually got it away before his death and resurrection. He, she got it right early on. So may our response be just like Martha's response. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. I believe. In other words, I pledge my full allegiance to Jesus and Jesus alone. He is the king of my life. He is the king of my family. My question to you today is, have you pledged your full allegiance to Jesus, to King Jesus? I did it in 1995. You know, I, I'm not from a Christian background. I got radically saved when, when, when I was 21 years old. And one of the first things I did, I got into the water of baptism. I had, these, had, had this amazing white robe on. <laughs> and, and, and so did the four other people that were baptized with me. We got baptized in a pool in, in the city of Demon near Amsterdam. And it was an amazing experience to declare loyalty and to demonstrate loyalty to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I never turned back from that decision. Yes, I had my ups and downs in my relationship with God, but I never left that decision alone. I always wanted to remain loyal to Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And whatever happens, you know, if I, if I get hit by the coronavirus or not, I know that I will be with Jesus for eternity. I will be in his presence for eternity. There is a bright future for all of us who ple pledge loyalty to the King of kings and Lord of lords. And you know, he's, besides our, being our savior and having eternity with him, he's also our healer. He's also our provider, and he can actually take care of us in the midst of this ordeal that we're all suffering globally at the moment. Jesus is waiting for you and I. He wants us to take that same decision, that same decision of loyalty towards him. So let's pray. Let's pray alongside the words of, of Martha's response to Jesus' question. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. And maybe you could, you and I, we could, you, you and everybody else who's watching can repeat after me in your own living room. Follow me. And I believe it's so important that we all pledge our loyalty to Jesus in the midst of this situation, that we crown him as king over our lives and over our families. So repeat after me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you, Lord, that you are king, that you are Lord. And God, I proclaim you as my Lord and my king. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that you came into this world to show us what it means to live as a representative of you, God. But you also came to die for me on that cross. And 
Forgive me, Lord, of all those times where I lived for myself, where I sinned in that way by being selfish, Lord, and making my life revolve around me rather than around you. And God, today I surrender to you. I give my full allegiance to you. And I surrender my life. I surrender my family to you. I surrender my finances, my health, my, my everything. I surrender it to you. And Lord, I want to say to you that you're my king. You're my Lord. There's no other Lord. There's no other king. There's no other priority in my life anymore. Thank you, Jesus, for doing what you've done for me and rising from the dead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you made the decision today to declare loyalty to Jesus by praying this prayer from your heart, or if maybe you've recommitted your life to him, we would love to hear about it. So if that's you, just send an email to info at celebrationchurch.nl or leave us a note on the form on our website. We'd love to hear about it. We'd love to help you get started on your journey and, and make sure that you're doing well in your journey with Jesus, in your journey of faith with him. May God bless you. Lift it up. So by your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected see your name.
great message that was from Pastor Sebastian. And, you know, we know that Easter this year looks a little bit different than the years before because we cannot come together with family and friends and have our Easter breakfast or just have an Easter celebration together. But we do want to take a moment to connect with each other. And you can do that as well through the Zoom meetings that we have every week after the service. There will be a QR code in the screen right now, or the link will be posted in the chat or in the description. And you can join us and connect with everybody who is viewing this service right now and just have a fun time together. We can share testimonies and just share how we were doing in this season. And it is also a great time to share communion together. We can't wait to see you there. And don't forget to check out our website, celebrationchurch.nl. We have collected a bunch of resources for you and for your kids. So just spend time in God's word this week or just do uh, fun crafts or games. Or maybe you want to uh, have the table guide, the Shabbat guide, to help you through a Shabbat dinner. Go check it out on the website and... Um, we can't wait to see you again next week. Hope you are tuning in then as well. And we hope that you have a great week and a great Easter Sunday.